Well, John, thank you so much for coming on the Gains for Girls podcast. Uh, but really, before we get into anything and talk about what you have been on the front lines of, I want you to be able to share a little bit about who you are and what you do. I'm a, a track coach and also for many years a, a high school teacher. I work in the building as a special ed assistant in the autism program. Um, and I've, but I've coached at the Olympic level, uh, professional track level for a, over a decade. Um, I coach elite high school athletes privately. And I've also been in the last couple of years, the head coach at Lake Oswego High School and also coach collegiately. So I have a, a, a wide a array of levels that I've coached at. So I understand the sport kind of deeper than most people. That would be typical high school coach because I have had Olympic medalists and had many people make, you know, all American at the collegiate level and compete. I've had someone compete in the, or qualify for the Olympic trials and every Olympic trials going back for decades. So it's, so I understand it from that level. And that brings me the perspective that I bring into the table on this particular issue. So you mean you're qualified? Uh, which I think is... I'm qualified to at least try to bring some, some rational sense to the, to the uh, argument or the discussion. No, I, I could not agree more. Uh, you are more than qualified. Uh, the sad thing is it doesn't even take those qualifications to see the position that you're coming from. Uh, and that position is, I'll re this, I read this headline actually to kind of preface what you've been facing, what we're talking about. I think it was from the New York Post uh, and the headline read, Oregon high school track and field coach was fired for proposing open division for athletes who identify as trans. And so, I mean, break this headline down for us. Uh, please share, you know, what you've experienced these past few weeks. Yeah, you know, going into the state meet, I asked my athletic director, could I write a letter uh, to the, you know, the OSAA, our state association? He said, yes. Um, and we talked about it. Yeah, very briefly. Your state meet, of course, there was a male who identified as a woman competing in the women's category. Correct. And raced my athlete in the four, had two athletes in the 400. One would play six first and one would play sixth. Um, and it caused great distress to them in the lead up to it. Their parents were very, you know, uh, concerned and, and had issues and were, but they're, they're afraid to speak out in any way. They, they definitely, I, I can speak enough to say they very much want to support all students and, and transgender students get support in every way. But they just felt like it was putting them under a, an unfair stress to have to race uh, in this kind of conditions um, where this uh, trans athlete, uh, you know, has just recently transitioned, was a bodybuilder before and was someone who's going to keep improving. And so I had pr fully prepared my uh, athlete for that and my Josie Donaldson to, to run fast at the uh, meet and be prepared. She's one of the best. She's number five in the nation uh, in the 400 meters. She made the U.S. under 20 team for the world championships. She's broke the old Oregon state record by over a second. So that empowered me to write the state and say, look, we can't change this for this year. I've never in there said that. But in my dismissal, it, they were trying to use the words I was trying to stop them from competing. I'm like, I never did that. I, all I was advocating for was, as you just said, and the, the post headline said, an open division that would allow competition so that the fans could cheer the transgender athletes uh, separately and, re and re recognize and reward their efforts, but not take away from the female athletes that were natural born females that are in a whole different competition level. Something that we, the reason we in, uh, start, <coughs> started uh, female sports in the first place. Um, and so it's, it's frustrating to, um, to, to see the reaction to that letter, which ironically, Riley, this is the most important thing. After the letter was sent, I sent it on a Sunday night late. On Tuesday, I see my athletic director in the hallway just passing, uh, and he says, uh, the lady at the state, uh, Kelly Foster, she received your letter, and she agrees with you, but she cannot respond, And I, as you might could imagine. I said, yeah, I understand why she couldn't write back, but she, uh, it's important that she said that. And he says, and I agree with it. And then the next day, I went to see my principal, just kind of bring her up to me and saying, hey, I wrote a letter. Chris may have told you, our AD, Chris Coleman. And I said, um, you, did you, uh, he went, she said, yes, I'm aware. And I, I agree as well. But, you know, we have to be careful because we have transgender students on him. I said, of course, this is not in any way trying to prevent them from having that, the opportunity to practice and compete. 
But there does need to be a distinction when we're talking about the highly competitive nature of high school sports these days. It's not just participatory, as some pundits want to say. It is very serious. So these kids, they take it very seriously. Um, and my girl Josie was just off that in the race at the state meet. It was only three tenths of a second off making the Olympic trial standard. And so had she done so, she'd have been able to go on. And it's important to note that the transgender athlete would not have been able to because of the rules that the, you know, the USATF and the, and the World Athletics have in place that would not allow this. And so there is a distinction there on the same track. Uh, right now, the Olympic trials are going on, and, and she could have been in that race that was run last night in the final. She may not have made the final. She's not quite that level yet, but she could have run in the first round. And, and that's the distinction that we're seeing is they're, they're, they're not taking that into consideration because they're sticking their heads in the sand. Of course, yeah, what you described uh, in terms of the private support <clears throat> is what I have seen time and time and time again at every level, whether it's, I mean, parents, whether it's people within the NCAA, I mean, you name it, uh, I have, I've certainly seen the same response. Um, and so you, you write this letter, but it got national attention, how your school essentially ousted you. And so how did it become public knowledge that these letters were sent? I don't know that. They've not told me how they, the athletic director at Portland school got hold of my letter because the question is, and there was no protesting of the letter as, as against board policy and hate speech and harassment, as I was told in the meeting that it qualified as simply for advocating for an open division. Cause that's all I did. That was, you know, that you can say there's any kind of discussion about it. I was just explaining like the unfairness of it uh, and why in trying to explain it. And they said, well, it's cause I identified as a employee of LO, but I said, but I also identified as some of the coaches at the Olympic level and the college level. And, and so I made it clear it wasn't the school's position, which is the, the position about this. That's so frustrating, but how it got public was, was he got it somehow. And I know since this has happened, Dozens of coaches have told me that they and, and many of their parents and others have, have written letters before the meet as well. So I don't know why I was singled out uh, other than what happened, you know, on the metal stand and the um, and, and off the track. That's been already debunked by my own investigation that said the appropriate the comment I made to the, the on the metal stand to uh, the athlete uh, that's transgender was was appropriate. It was not neither positive or negative. It was just a comment. Like, you know, you make comments to people and I was trying to be supportive because I feel this kid's in a tough position and wanted to try to be a bit empathetic, but also, you know, state that, you know, this is, this is a competition that uh, we are all having conflict about and recognize that this is tough for them. And so the comment was a nothing comment, but uh, it was taken out of context by again, uh, how, some people wanted to hear it from what they must have said. They didn't ask. The investigation didn't ask. Um, the you know, the, I mean, the newspaper reporter for the Oregonian, for example, reported it, and I said, and I refuted back. I said, you didn't give me a chance to respond, and that isn't what was said. Ask Josie Donaldson. Ask the girl that was in third place. Um, but you know, those kind of things, it's like were nothing anyway, because it, like I said, it was determined by my own investigation to be a nothing. Uh, an, an, not an inappropriate comment. And so it, that's, what I think, what started it, uh, to the, the, this one pushback. I mean, there were such ridiculous things as I was the one who got the crowd to boo in the same comment and that I had been all year uh, advocating against this kid. I'm, I didn't do anything. I didn't say, I mean, I didn't even, I, you know, up until I was trying to keep my, myself from like getting, saying thing that would be, you know, inappropriate because that's what we're all been taught to do. But as, as I've gone through this process since then, I'm like, why can't we advocate for our girls? Why we must advocate for our female athletes? Who's going to do it? Nobody else is doing it. The politicians aren't doing it. The the politic, the, the leadership and the sport isn't doing it. Um, and they're ignoring that aspect and trying to basically avoid lawsuits over trying to put limitations on competition when they could find ways that other states have done, or they could find ways that you know, like what the World Aquatics has told Leah Thomas, you can compete in the open division but you don't get to run it to swim against Riley Gaines and other swimmers because it's got, you have an advantage. And I, you know, and the, the water decision is insightful and I don't necessarily agree with the whole complexity of, you know, saying that you have to have started treatment by age 12. That seems a bit early. 
Um, I'm not necessarily in favor of that. But what that message sends is clearly that the um, athletes have an advantage. Because once you start going through puberty and adolescence as a boy, you start getting things that you can't ever give back, that you don't ever, you're going to maintain. Even if you start home long treatment, you may have a reduction, but you're still going to have it. And that's what that decision is saying. And so that's why it's all more important. We advocate for female um, athletes to have that protection in the, on the track and the pool and in other athletic you know, endeavors because it is unfair on so many levels. And so I don't know how they got the letter. I don't know why they wanted to make this, why they wanted to take a stand on it. But I'm taking my stand because I know I stand for what's right. And 99.9% of I mean, anybody disagree with me in person. I've been at the Olympic trials the last three days. I'm headed back down tonight. Um, and it's been heartwarming to have officials of all major shoe companies of, uh, of all uh, former Olympic gold me or uh, medalists in different events to have at current athletes, to have coaches at the professional level that are my friends and colleagues and coaching uh, there in the last couple of years with one of my high school girls who was at that level and qualified for the Olympic trials. So I know she's unable to compete um, to have all the, I just have random people about an average, about one every five to 10 minutes come up to me uh, and, you know, and say, Hey, we're behind you hundred percent is empowering. And it shows me that, you know, and it's, it's why uh, my attorneys had said, you know, you, we need to get you some support. And so they allowed me to start a, uh, that or that they started, my parents started um, a uh, GoFundMe because I'm going to lose my health insurance. And so all these kind of things here uh, are in, empowering to feel like people care that they want to do that for me. And so it's, it's one of those things that's been frustrating, but at the same time, it makes me feel good that I'm trying to do something good for, for the entirety of female sports and this argument that needs to be d discussed at a properly and not just dismissing me quickly because you're being hastily uh, accepting at face value some charges that were all be, uh, are all being debunked. My appeal is unofficial until Wednesday when I have to submit the official appeal, but, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's something I'm happy to turn in because I can, you know, uh, exonerate myself uh, for all this. Of course. Sorry, well, I got you... long-winded there. No, no, please. You're totally fine. Uh, it's nice to hear you elaborate. Um, I couldn't agree more when you say, look, the people coming up to you and support, that's why this doesn't make sense to me. Uh, because in day-to-day -day life, your everyday common sense American, regardless of how they politically align, they agree with yes. you and with I, and they understand that you really have taken a stance on this issue that is a stand that is, of course, it's rooted in truth, but the way you have been able to present yourself in every interview that I've seen uh, has really been done with grace um, and it has shown empathy as for people who identify as trans, but also empathy for women and girls, um, which is commonly left out of this equation. Did you ever get a response from, from the letters that you sent to your, to your state Senator? No, nothing yet. And in the irony of it, Riley, is that I had a very positive first meeting with him, met with him once in person five years ago, uh, to advocate as I've been a long time social studies teacher and mostly in economics and government. And I advocated for requiring the uh, financial literacy and civics to be taught as graduation requirements in Oregon because they weren't. And he eventually kind of got through the, the state government, got signed and put into law and being implemented uh, in the last couple of years. And so I took pride in having had that. So when I reached out to him, I identified myself saying, remember, I visited with you and you get, I get asked for a 10 minute meeting and I got 45 minutes and he was blown away by the presentation I gave him. He said, how long did it take you to put this together? I said, oh, about 40 minutes. And it's just like, I'm passionate about what I do in those things. And I'm passionate in this area. And I'm more passionate in this area because of my sister and my a very strong mother that have inspired me going back to in getting in, uh, involved in my career. And, you know, why a state senator is going to, going to deny his female constituents and even males that, that want to speak up, as you know, for this right is beyond me because it's not political. It's not, it's not a right thing. It's not a left thing. It's a common sense. And it's, it's obviously science. It's just, just something we all can identify quite, quite easily. Of course. It's a, a humanitarian issue more than I would say it's, it's a political one. 100%. Um, but the state championships, we've, we've alluded to it in Oregon, uh, watching a boy, cross the finish line first, taking a state title away from a deserving girl. I mean, what was this 
I mean, the raw emotion, the, the feelings of it as a coach watching this, I, I can, of course, I've seen this firsthand and I know how I felt. I felt betrayed. I felt belittled. I felt as if we were being mocked. Um, but, but what were, what were your emotions watching this? Well, I didn't actually see the 200. I haven't watched the video because I didn't have a girl in it since my elite girl, Mia, who's the state record holder, uh, but whose records could be under threat because this individual has two more years. And as part of my inspiration is like, uh, to, to not just, as you just used the word mock, uh, I, I, I just don't think it's right to think you can break records um, when you have this advantage. It's, you know, it'd be just like you having to swim against somebody or an athlete running against someone who just for the last two years took steroids and got their testosterone levels really high. And then they, right before they get tested, they, they get off it, but they don't lose the, um, the benefits of all those, the training and whatnot with the, with the drugs. So it's the same kind of thing. Uh, you have this advantage and to put, to deny that is ridiculous. So watching it, uh, hearing it, I, I was in the warm area because we had a boy trying to win the 200, he'd won the hundred and we were in contention for the team. Call. So I was in the warm-up area, which is outside the stadium in Hayward. You can't see anything. Uh, and so I didn't know what happened. Uh, I heard a little bit of booing. Uh, and that someone said, I thought they just ran the 200. I said, oh, uh, yeah, that's not surprising. So then I'm walking back in the stadium and they're doing the medal ceremony for it. And you have to go up these stairs and then you walk along the concourse. And I hear it as I was actually coming out of the restroom. And and I was like, wow, that's loud. And, and I realized what they were saying when I walked out the portal to see what it was. And, and it was, um, you know, it, it was frustrating that that even had to happen, right? We shouldn't have had uh, anybody have to boo, but I think, I think that most of the people that booed were booing because they were upset with the policymakers to put this situation in place because it was unfair to uh, the girl in second place, Astra Jones, to not get recognized and stand atop the podium and have their shining moment that they're never going to get back um, just because some policymakers think that uh, they don't get that having this uh, transgender athlete competing is is goes beyond the norm of, of giving them their rights. This uh, individual uh, in the transgender should have every right in the classroom, in society and life and every other way, but as the constitution protects that, but on the athletic fields, they should not. And it's, it's in, it's impossible for me to get my head around that they, that they're okay with that. And obviously the comment that I received from the OSAA's representative that oversees track uh, made clear that they aren't, but they, they feel like their hands are tied. So it's like, if I don't speak up loudly enough, who the hell is going to do something? They're trying to silence me. They're trying to make, make you know, make, make this it, issue go away. They hope it's just going to go away. Right, right. Well, that's, I mean, and effectively firing you, what, what they're doing to you is making an example, saying, hey, this is what happens if you do speak up. And you don't want to lose your job, do you? You know, that's not what you want. So I suggest you be kind and I suggest you be inclusive. That's that's what they're doing to you. And yeah, you mentioned the the OS uh, AA, uh, which I, is, I think it's the Oregon School Activities Association. Correct. Uh, but they have a policy in place. I was reading up on this before, just trying to, to fully understand. I mean, I could have told you what it said and, and uh, I was correct in thinking that the policy basically says, actually, I have it right here. It says, uh, they allow students to participate in the athletic or activity program of their consistently asserted gender identity while providing a fair, a, a fair and safe environment for all students, which the sentence itself is contradictory. Those two things cannot be mutually exclusive. I mean, they can't coexist in the way that the policy is saying that they can. Uh, you've mentioned the clip or I guess the booing on the podium, that, that clip went viral. But I thought the most powerful part of the video that I saw was not only how um, the rightful state champion uh, was cheered and applauded and, and how the boy, when he stood atop the podium, was, was booed. Um, I thought the most powerful part of this video was the response from the girls uh, and their body language on the podium. It was really... I'll use the word incredible. Of course, it's incredibly unfortunate. It should have never happened, but it was incredible to see, even without saying words, uh, you could feel and see the solemnness. You could see the, 
just dismay that these girls were feeling. And now we've seen boys uh, win a girls high school track and field state title in five states, five out of 50. I mean, that's, that's 10% of states and it's only exponentially increasing. And so as a coach, do you ever see this happening the other way around where girls are entering into and winning boys races? <laughs> um, no. And, you know, uh, it's it, it's because it won't happen because the physical things that are scientific. Uh, are there exceptional women that could beat boys? Yes. I coach the fastest female history in history in the 100 meters and uh, one of the fastest in 200 meters. Um, and in Mia Bride Peterson and Mia raced some boys last year to try to get some competition, but it wasn't meant, it was only a, we're going to help each other out. And it wasn't like they scored separate and it was just a, you know, a thing. And people say, well, that's a contradiction. No, I'm not. It's not when you're that good. And some guys, and it was two of my guys ran against her. They, you know, she won the race, but it wasn't the best, you know, uh, boys in the state. She couldn't win the state title. And that, and she is the literally the, the national high school record holder for competition when it's only high school athletes, but no, so that wouldn't happen. And, you know, on the medal stand, you know, that, that thing is so, uh, you know, to me, it's emotional to all of us because we know that that's why you compete. That's why you train hard is to get up on that medal stand and to deny it to kids is something that I just can't, can't abide by that. You're going to take it away because you you know, you're going to allow this as you going back to your statement on the OSAA statement, you know, it's not like we're in the band or orchestra, which they also oversee, uh, uh, you know, this, this is where there is a physical advantage. And we just have to keep that in mind through all this. Of course. Um, this, this ruling, you know, is it, is it coming more so from school boards? Is it coming from the state level? We've seen the attacks at the federal level, uh, by the Biden administration pertaining to, mm -hmm to title nine. And so I guess my question for you is who is really at fault here? I think I personally, I mean, I think there's a lot of fingers to point, right? You could point fingers at, at people who stay silent, like, like parents or, or what have you. Uh, I, I think that's a bit unfair, um, given the fact that people are in different positions and there are risk and there are threats, but, but who's at fault here? Well, I think the, the state politicians are most at fault. When I write the, the head of the Senate, who happens to be my, we're in the district where I live, Rob Wagner, and he does nothing to respond to me on obviously a very important issue that obviously many Oregonians care about uh, far more than even participate in sports, but they care about it for the, their friends, their neighbors, their relatives. And it to me, it's one of those things like, all I asked him in my letter was, is it correct that the OSAA is, is mis, I mean, that the, it, it misinterpreting the state law? Because it does. I've read the law. And one of my, uh, several of my parents are lawyers. I have a pro bono lawyer that's vastly overworked trying to defend me for the school district. My union lawyers backed out saying, well, you've, your contract is up and you got fired, so we can't represent you anymore. And I'm like, why did I pay union dues? That's a whole other issue. Um, but the, um, but so, they, this, but this other uh, parent who's also an attorney uh, is one and, and her, their daughter was impacted by this directly in the, during the season um, and at the state meet was sharing this law with me. And, you know, and you, and you can see how that says they do have the right to draw some distinctions to keep, as you use the word that they use in their fair uh, competition and to keep it safe. Well, it certainly isn't safe when they have to have a police escort uh, for the whole weekend for this athlete. And if they don't change the rule, I can only imagine it getting worse in the future. I, I hate to think that's not going to happen. I'm not going to make some changes to, to be, so that we don't have this. I mean, in my letter, I said, we need a, a law that says we cheer for all in which we open up this open division and we encourage participation in the transgender community, which will probably bring more out that right now are fr quite frankly afraid to come out because they don't want to face this. And they do realize it's unfair and I have two in my family, two transgender athletes, or not athletes, but two transgender uh, individuals in my family who feel this way. And it, and it's one of the things that I think is uh, we have to adamantly uh, ask our politicians, why aren't you doing something? The OSWA officials, should they should be advocating back to the politicians, help us out. 
especially if they, if what is true that from athletic director, which I have no reason to believe it not, that we don't want to keep doing this. Nobody wants to go through this again. And you're right. They're trying to silence me. That's what I'm being made the example. Like, don't get out of line. And that's why leading up to it, they said not to say anything. And then I didn't say anything during the entire meet um, about it publicly. Uh, you know, it was just, uh, it was ridiculous. And it was being talked about by so many people in the stadium. And it, you ask the parents and stuff, that, since my situation's coming out, like, my goodness, you, they, we could fire every coach in the stadium if you want to get right down to it. And I'm like, potentially so. And I said, but I'm being made the example of because we can't have that. And, you know, listening to you, it actually reminds me of another coach in your state, nonetheless, uh, who's received similar treatment. And this is Coach Dave Brown and his wonderful wife, Judy. Uh, I've been able to talk with them. They've come on the podcast before. Um, he's one who went to, to a school board meeting and said, hey, what we're experiencing in our sports are wrong. It's unfair. And he quit. He quit coaching after, I mean, I, I forget the number, but I mean, uh, decades of coaching similar to you, athletes who loved him, parents who loved him, um, but he just couldn't do it anymore. And so it, it reminds me of that. And again, in your state, <laughs> nonetheless, uh, but what are your plans next? I mean, what's, what in the future, are, do you continue to plan to continue to push back on this? Do you want to get back into coaching? What's next for you? Well, the, the first thing is my parents and, and my attorneys hope that we can get the, the school board and the principal to recognize a lot of the stuff that was accused by this other district's uh, athletic director was patently false. Their interpretation of the letter was improper. It was ignoring the right for me to, to advocate, my First Amendment right to advocate for freedom of speech. One attorney friend of mine um, said that my case looks like it would get protected by the uh, Kennedy versus Bremerton case in the prayer case, um, which is still First Amendment because they're in large, large part of the, uh, of the uh, evidence against me was coming from these letters and they're and saying it was hate speech. And I'm like, I was, uh, you can't have political speech on one side and not have it on the other. And so you are ignoring these aspects of the legal uh, situation here. And so I'd like that. Some say, could you go back? I said, I'd go back because these girls and um, and even the guys on the team have supported me 100 percent and their parents 100 percent. And so and that, that's why they started to go fund me for to help me out because I'm losing my health insurance and they want they want to see me back. I've already had people at other schools say, hey, we'd love to have you over here. Not unfortunately, the athletic officials, but the parents reach out to me. Um, and a couple of schools have openings and they're like, Come, you're welcome. And, you know, one's in the community in which I live. I'm not sure what will ever happen with that. But I also never, wasn't coaching a high school before this started. I've been a private coach. I've got some private coaching to do this afternoon uh, before I go back to Eugene. Some are college kids home for the summer and some are my elite kids going on to the world under 20 championships. So I can, I'll keep coaching, but I'll keep advocating for this issue to the day I die. My sister uh, passed in 2020. She was a federal judge and she was an athlete who was a product of title nine and got a college scholarship to run. Wouldn't have had that opportunity. I inspired her and now she inspires me and her, uh, her memory to kind of push for this sort of thing. And I'm be damned if I'm going to uh, not fight every bit I can to use and, uh, uh, you know, this opportunity to say, we must sit at the table. We must solve this issue. Of course. Well, I just wanted to read you a couple messages that I've gotten from parents, from female athletes themselves in Oregon who know you. And I, again, I think it speaks volumes about who you are, uh, not just as a coach, but I think more importantly, as a person, uh, this is from someone, they said, they just fired my track coach. Uh, who coached, he actually coached the girl who beat the boy here in Oregon. All he did was express why he think we sh why he thought we should rethink the rules. He's taken this team to the state championship three years in a row now. This is insane. What can we do? This is another one that says, I have known so many people whose sons and daughters who have run for this man and said that he is the best human ever. How can we help? I mean, these are just everyday people. I could keep going, John, <laughs> of messages that I've received. That That just shows how many people's lives that you've touched and that you will certainly continue touching uh, as you keep keep coaching, but keep advocating for this issue too. Uh, well, what can we do to support 
you, is there a website that we can go to, to donate, uh, to, well, to keep following along with what you're doing? Yeah, there's, there's a GoFundMe. Uh, I can't actually remember the name, what, what it's called. It's, under, it's got my name in it, John Parks. Let me look up what my parent said on this. Um, it's right here. Um, it's the, uh, support coach, John Parks on GoFundMe. Um, and, um, they can donate to that and money that I'm not in a, I'm not in a poverty situation, but I'm, but I am losing my health insurance on June 30th. And I uh, have other expenses, obviously losing my income that will have to transition. But it's more like if some of this, if this money is ex exceeds anything, sometimes you hear about these kind of things. I want to let people know, I'm going to use it to advocate for this, to push for um, this kind of support to, to push back. It's not going to go to enrich me personally after just covering my basic things I'm going to lose. It will go to a hundred percent towards this cause. And it, and it may end up being a donation or whatever to a group that's fighting for these rights or I do, you know, whatever way I can advocate for it. Cause mm -hmm. I appreciate their, everybody wanting to support me. I appreciate people coming up and support me. It is a, a challenge and it hurts to lose. Cause it, I mean, this quotes almost made me come to tears because I, I, really love the the relationships and coaching and and the what you can do of, of seeing kids grow and um and coaching at all different levels i've had different types of experiences but in each one i've always felt like i've made a positive impact and try to and sometimes um you, you know you want to do more but you, you're certainly trying for every kid to grow and become a better human and that's been my modus operandi of coaching all along it's i think the reason i have success i'm a i think i'm a, for the high school level i see in the co in the coaching technical aspects but i think my secret's always been i show the kids i give a damn that i care and i really empowered you know but i'm at the meet yesterday and i'm talking to coaches there say hey i've got a, a kid on my, my team my, my old team but i got a, she's you know she's gonna be a senior next year and i think she'd be a great fit for your school and they're like yes that's you know it's great and um so i I'm always going to be advocating for my athletes and trying to help them reach their goals. And I appreciate those people recognizing that because it makes me feel a little bit better about, you know, the situation. Cause it's, it's, you know, you worry about some people can say, Oh, there's something we're not know. No, there's really nothing else you don't know on this. I've, I've been pretty transparent as much as it can be about it with the legal issues hanging over me. And so it's very frustrating um, in that aspect, but very, very rewarding in all the other ways. So I appreciate the support. And I appreciate you giving me a chance to talk about it. Of course. Well, people, people are, are, I think, waking up. They understand uh, the hoax that can be the media sometimes. That article you mentioned, um, the, the Oregonian or whatever it's called, that was the most atrocious, I mean, slanderous piece. And, but people see it. They well, really see, and that's the thing. Let me say this quick story, Riley. I, um, I had planned for six, eight months, um, really longer than that, but it, but, officially planned on that day to take my French husband, the cousin, my cousin who lives in Atlanta and her French born husband, a uh, wine tasting. He's a big wine guy and Oregon's got a great wine country. And so we had planned it and it was the three of us. And, and I'm needing to talk to uh, this reporter from Oregonian. And I, I talked to a, another one I knew better and I could trust because he was a veteran reporter. He retired and yeah, and I knew he would, would understand where I was coming from better and, but then this other guy was trying to get a hold of me. I said, I, I'll talk to you tonight. But before I could, he, he posts all that stuff that's in that story. I subsequently provided the um, information from my principal's uh, report that refuted several of the things that were slanderous that you mentioned there in that article. That was on Tuesday and into Wednesday. And they still didn't make a full correction on the online, which isn't that hard. I emailed again the editor of the paper, Teresa Bottomley, and I said, why this get run today on Sunday in the hard copy, the printed edition, when another reporter for them had taken over? Because in defense of the other guy, he's a young guy, and he, he was getting married on Saturday, apparently, is what I was told. And so his mind probably wasn't 100% on, on his work. But that's no defense. That's no excuse. They, sh they slandered me by allowing this to come out. And I've got witnesses. I gave them phone numbers, talked to these people, talked to people from other schools that can refute all the things that were said in that piece against me. Um, and so it's really frustrating um, that that is still out there. Uh, I've made that clear. Uh, and, you know, we'll see what happens with the, with the Oregonian and their, what they publish in the future. But trust me, I'm 
uh, 100% not in any way uh, accepting that that can happen. And so that's, you know, I can't, without saying too much, I'm going to say there'll be, there'll be recourse. Good. Well, good. It's, it's pushback like that, that will help uh, others that will transcend far beyond just, just you and this topic, uh, because if it's happening here, if it can happen to you, John Parks, it can happen to anyone. Exactly. Uh, so we could not be more grateful for you. We will certainly support you. I encourage everyone to check out your GoFundMe. Uh, this is a worthwhile cause. Uh, it is a necessary one. Uh, and we'll be amplifying anything along the way, any updates, any progress uh, with you and, and what you're pursuing, what you're fighting for. Uh, and so again, thank you for so fearlessly defending your athletes. I wish we had more coaches like you. Well, I appreciate that. And again, I, I appreciate your efforts to protect girls in female sports because uh, without that protection, we'll lose them, I'll lose the integrity of what we've been, the reason they exist in the first place. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I've said it before and I will say it again. I always love talking to people who understand what's at stake. Just your everyday person uh, who was unfortunately directly impacted by this movement. They saw the adverse effects of the gender ideology movement and what it has meant to them and their livelihoods. Uh, could it be more grateful for John Parks, uh, his ability and willingness to stand firm when called. Uh, I hope we can all be like John. We can all certainly learn from John. Make sure you check us out at outkick.com. Like and subscribe anywhere where you get your podcast. I hope you celebrate the anniversary of Title IX accordingly. Call out the hypocrisy. Don't let these virtue signaling Democrats, uh, these elected officials, get away with posting on Twitter or on X or, or any other social media platform, standing on the House floor, telling you that they champion women and girls because they don't. They can't even define what one is. And how in the world can you defend what you can't even define? Call out the hypocrisy. It's our job as, as Americans, as American citizens to do just that. Uh, but nonetheless, we will see you guys again next week. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. The fight to save women's sports and restore common sense is far from over. And I continue the conversation every week. So make sure to catch more content over here and subscribe to Outkick so you don't miss a thing.